Welcome, fellow travelers, to Fate's Wide Wheel. I'm your host, Sam Fain, and uh, it's hard for me to not give this the appellation of a very special episode because, well, it is. And I am joined by the writer of episode 213, Against Time, the season two finale, Drew Lindo. Uh, Drew, how are you? I'm great. I've been waiting to chat with you about this episode for what feels like forever. It does feel like a while, doesn't it? Uh, and we are also joined by the uh, one and only friend of the show, yours and mine, uh, Dean George Harris. Dean, of course, executive producer, co-showrunner, writer uh, on the show. Uh, Dean, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's fun to be talking about this finally. Yeah, well, it's it's a pleasure to have you back on. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to talk about not only, of course, Against Time, but just season two as a whole. Uh, this is this is going to be uh, an interesting ride. So so buckle up, listeners and viewers. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We're just going to dive right in. Dean, I'm going to start with you. Now that the season has been seen as a whole, what are your thoughts and maybe hopes for uh, some of the takeaways for this season? Gee, that's a tough question. It's a good question. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was thinking earlier when a, when a show is on a different platform, like a streaming platform, you can see, you know, you can sit and you can binge it. And in a lot of ways, I think season two of Quantum Leap was kind of almost designed to be a book you could read in one or two sittings if you wanted to. I, you know, I, I, and so I think one of my takeaways would be for the, you know, for the fans that they can go back and rewatch it and maybe not have to wait weeks or months, you know, between certain ebbs and flows and, um, and get the experience, I think, as it was originally intended. You know, we did intend a break after eight. Um, we didn't intend a, you know, we didn't intend quite such a, such a break. But um, so I think that, and I think, you know, look, we made a decision to do something that is not necessarily always wise, which is to split your relationship apart at the start of season two, right? You know, and that's, I, I think, probably disappointed a portion of the fan base because they were invested in Ben and Addison, and I understand that. And so, but we did it knowing where we were going to end up. I mean, I will say, like, fans should know, like, this, we knew exactly where this season was going. Um, and so my hope is that our intention which was to never make the show feel exactly like a story you've seen before, but ultimately tell a very hopeful story, which is that like, yes, these two were torn apart and yes, they go through these individual experiences, but ultimately they come back together in a new way. And frankly, they would have to come back together in a new way because he was leaping for a season you know what I mean? For me, it'd just be so phony if it's like, I'm back and we're all good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, this is a guy who left without telling her. This is a guy who did not give Addison a say in protecting her life. You know what I mean? Like, he, I think he, Ben made a couple original sins. Did it yeah. out of love. But so I just, I guess my hope is that they'll appreciate that and they'll, and they'll sort of see how Hannah functions, how Tom functions, you know, how, how, People in our lives don't have to be one thing, you know, like they're my friend, they're my lover. This was the relationship that did this. It's like you need to experience it sort of as a whole. And at the, you know, and the last thing I'll say is I hope they, I hope they were as moved as I was when Addison touches her hair and realizes she's in a leap, which is just <laughs> this moment I love. And then when they hug each other, you know, cause I was really, I mean, I just think Drew wrote such a beautiful finale and, um, you know, I was moved watching it and I, I hope they feel that way too. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was incredibly moved as well. Um, Drew, uh, let's, let's talk about, you know, bringing it all home, you know, with, with the finale and you had spoken to me at one point about like that sense of ownership 
um, just to, you know, over, over the show and, you know, and artistically for, for anyone that's, that's thinking like, this is mine. It's not that it's just the idea that like, you know, if you kind of have that ownership, you're invested in it in, in, in kind of a different way than if you're just kind of clocking hours, basically. Um, can you talk about how that grew over the course of the season and then what it was like to be able to craft the finale? Yeah, that's a terrific question. I certainly felt at the beginning of the season impressed and a little, I don't want to say intimidated, but Dean and Martin, like, really came in guns blazing at the top of the season. Like, here's how we're taking the show in a different direction. And I had pitches and ideas that were not, you know, I had to get up to speed on the direction we were going this season. There wasn't going to be a new big secret. There wasn't going to be a new lost memory. There was, like, we were not doing that anymore. Yeah. And the decisions made by our showrunners were about how we're going to tell a more emotionally accessible story, how we're going to make it more immediate and involving, how we're going to give both of these characters a stronger point of view because Ben didn't know why he did the things he did in season one. And now these two people have strong points of view of where they're coming from. And so I was, I was getting up to speed on that and, and also producing episodes that we were still making in season one, because <laughs> there was no break. So we were like, I was sort of like, okay, we're doing this. And I, okay, I'll, I'll be a, a good soldier and figure out how I can contribute ideas to this new vision. And, <laughs> Um, and then also just because of the way we were doing the season, you know, my last episode was episode nine of season one and they were in top of season two. It was like, because you're producing and we have some other writers, we're going to give them episodes up top and then we'll get you in when you, so I was sort of, I felt a little out of the loop at the beginning of the season, but then Dean and Martin gave me episode six to write, which was a really important one. And almost immediately I found a way to personally invest in that story, which is telling a, a story about crossing paths with someone for a limited amount of time and it being incredibly important for both of you, you know, like uh, the effect it can have and, um, and Ben sort of getting to be himself in a way that he hadn't been before on the leap. And that episode I felt totally personally invested in. I was able to bring something personal to it while still servicing this new vision that, that Dean and Martin had come up with. And so I think I was on set for episode six, we were shooting and you know, the, the strike was impending and Dean called me on set and said, Ben and Derek are going to write 12 and you're going to write 13. And I was speech. I told him, I was like, I, I am speechless. I don't know what to say. I've never been able to write a season finale before. And I felt like a complete reversal happening where I was like, okay, now I'm on board with the, this direction and this very clearly articulated creative direction we're going in. And I feel emotionally connected to it in a way. And now I feel like I can really start filling in some more from my own voice and in, into that vision. And so with 13, it was a great opportunity to say, okay, what have Dean and Martin already have worked out? They had worked out that they wanted this apology from Ben to young Jeffrey. They'd worked out, we, you know, we talked as a room about Addison fulfilling her destiny, but the rest of that, there was a lot of I could generate and contribute. And so um, it was an opportunity to sort of like help co-author the end of, of the, of the season, but also a lot of ideas from last season. I'd never got to do a lot of stories. I never got to tell that I wanted to found their way into this finale things from Janice and Beth and um, and even the final leap out were all things that I wanted to do last season in one way or another. So it, it was a beautiful full circle moment. And I feel like I'm just really grateful that they gave me the opportunity to, to tell this story that was, you know, uh, a punctuation mark to a sentence they all started. And it was so beautifully articulated. That it was just such a joy to, to find a personal way in and talk about things that matter to me as well about loss and trauma and moving forward and um and what we can do you know what what power we do have while we're here so i i was beyond fortunate and and uh honored um i mean all and it all comes through you know that when you when you're able to have that level of investment and put so much of yourself into something uh, i think that the finale is, is a testament to that because it's just an incredible uh work of art, quite frankly, and an incredible culmination of, of this season. And, and honestly, the first season as well. And it's funny, because I feel like there were some conversations that uh, I, I was lucky enough to have, where we, we, we were hyper focused on season two, you know, we're just talking about things within the context of season two, and Dean kind of going back to one of the things that you said about the season being so bingeable, I completely agree. Um, I would go a step further and say that it's almost bingeable in like three specific chunks. Like you look at the first four episodes, then you look at like five, six, seven, and eight, and then you look at these last five. And it's almost like they're, they're books within a novel, you know, it's like book one, chapter one, that sort of thing. And it, and it just fits so perfectly together in that respect. However, having said that, after after seeing against time, 
you start to realize that there are so many threads reaching all the way back to season one. Um, when creating this this story for the season, how important was it to you to not disregard what had come before? Because in so many ways, the first few episodes of season two feel like a clean slate. And right. then as, as it all starts to come together, you realize, no, there's there's you know, a bigger picture at work here. So, Dean, how important was it to you to still you know remain that connective tissue to the first season? You know, I think maybe the most useful way to answer this question is just to talk a tiny bit about how you build the season or how we built the season. Absolutely. You know, so the season obviously started with Martin's idea of the time jump that you know, we've been, talked about before on podcasts and what that unlocks. Um, and that almost immediately gave rise to Hannah and Tom and um, pretty quickly how they would both function within the story. And, you know, like something that, we did a tiny bit at the end of season one, but it's just really tiny is this notion of a character having time because of Quantum Leap had the, their whole lifetime, like Ian had his, their whole lifetime to figure out the cheat code. So the idea <laughs> but that was just a, a tiny piece, whereas we could make it the centerpiece of, of the Hannah story. Um, and so where I was going with that is to say, we really were building the second season out to be a complete story focused on the second season. And I think we knew we were, you know, some of the themes that we as writers have brought to this show, like in particular the notions of sacrifice and the notion of who's saying that this program's not going exactly the way we want mm. it to. Or as I always say to people, like I used to say that Sam Beckett card is as sad as we all say think it is. Like I, yeah. I, I always say, I, I'm, I hope he's out there leaping because uh, you know I could use it every now and then. Um, <laughs> one of the things I think Drew did that was was extraordinary was you know we didn't Martin and I didn't sit down and say okay and so in the finale we're going to have Janice come back and that's going to help magic in an A-team like pull up, you know, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't have a lot of those details at the beginning. And frankly, we didn't have all of them, even when Drew, when we broke the episode, I mean, you know, a lot of that. So I would say a lot of the ties to the first season, it's, it was built into the DNA of the show. And if you, as a writer, if you stay on theme, you find, you always find these connections back that, you didn't think of that, as I always say to Martin, like, well, this is going to make us look smarter than we are. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I remember when I read, you know, Drew called me, because you know, we're all very close. And Drew called me at the outline stage before I read the outline. And he's like, man, I just I just feel like this one. I just feel good about this one. And he had that tone in his voice. Mm -hmm. And then he sent me to 13, sent it to all of us. And my assistant actually read it about 45 minutes before me and was just so psyched. <laughs> um, and so, sorry, it's a long answer to say, I would say 50% of the ties to the first season are just inherent in the way this writer's room created both seasons. Um, but I also think it, you know, Drew found a way to bring in some threads that I didn't even realize we could. And I was, you know, some of my biggest smiles as a, as a reader and as a viewer were, you know, the Janice return, the Beth ha comes with iced coffees, you know, the, the backstory being whether I waited or didn't wait. I mean, like this, these were beautiful ties and, and, and really this is the advantage of having an amazing writing staff is that you, you kind of benefit from, from, you can take the best of what everybody has. Yeah. I, um, I obviously was incredibly moved uh, and excited to see Janice back, to see Beth back, to see that scene where, you know, everything comes full circle, really. Like, I mean, really everything going back to the classic series. Um, the I, I would love for you to talk a little bit, Drew, about um, not only the decision to bring Janice back, but also knowing how you know she was someone that a lot of people wanted to see back and and, and wanted to see back as, as like a regular right but for me personally the payoff of seeing her back here uh is so much more powerful um yeah. so so talk about you know where that idea came from why you decided to bring her back and um and then i'll ask you another question <laughs> yeah. no this is one i've been wanting to talk about so you know 
I remember being on set in 103 last year for somebody up there like Ben and chatting with meeting Georgina for the first time, talking with her and Susan and just saying, you know, it's crazy because for Janice, like without Quantum Leap, she wouldn't even be, you know, we were just having that little chat behind the scenes and it was way too early in the show to get into any of that stuff for a myriad of reasons. But it was something that I was always in the back of my mind to the point where in Fellow Travelers, I wrote this moment between Janice and Jen when they finally get face to face. And Jen says, why are you helping Ben save Addison? You don't even know her. Why are you doing this? And Janice does not answer her question. She spins the scene around. And yes, if, when you watch the whole season of one, you, it's clear like, well, killing Addison was meant to destroy Quantum Leap and it's her dad's project and yada, yada, yada. Of course, she's a good guy at the end of the day. That all makes sense. But that, to me, there was always this deeper reason, right, that I really wanted to explore in the show. And not only that, just from a, from a storytelling mechanic perspective, the minute we introduced Janice having her own imaging chamber, having that hand link, and I, I, you know, I knew Janice was not the big bad. We all knew she was, she was sort of an antagonist, but an antihero. I immediately thought this would be a great thing to go back to someday if the project ever falls in the wrong hands. So those things were all waiting and, and ready to go back to. And it was, as you said, like Janice returns when we are in our darkest hour. So it's the most satisfying way she can come back rather than like us trying to find stuff for her to do in HQ and everybody is trying to find stuff to do in HQ. But also for Beth, I felt like in Ben and Derek's episode, One Night in Koreatown, we really explored this is a loaded subject for her to be intimately involved with a man who is working at the project that took such a toll on her husband's life. It's a very complicated set of emotions for her. And I felt like we needed to kind of resolve that to some degree. So this all set the stage for 13 where it's like, okay, when this project is in the wrong hands, when it's about to go down to a very dark road, this family will show up. They will come to the rescue because this, no, no matter what it cost them, no matter what it did to Al's heart, you know, it's everything to them because it gave them their entire life and their entire new um, familial history. So it was just an opportunity to bring all that together and then the most really exciting thing was, okay, this is going to help kind of tease a butterfly effect because that's what happened to, to Beth. Mm -hmm. But on a deeper level, like, holy shit, a Addison is MIA. Like, Addison is walking in Beth's footsteps in a way that yeah. I don't think anybody watching the show this season was fully aware of until that very moment when she says, my mom never waited for him. And, you, and I wrote that into the script, that angle on Addison, taking that in, knowing she was going to have to reconcile that with Ben in the episode. So... When you wait for stuff and you pay it off the right way, it's so much more satisfying than just, you know, and I feel like Susan and, and Georgina are both so terrific in the episode and they, they really, it moves me. Every time Susan starts talking about Al and we need to get back, something about those two generations working together, with these two shows working together, uh, really moves me and inspires me. And, and I was just, again, thrilled that they let me do it. Um. Yeah, I, it, it, like I said, it was an incredible moment for me. And one of the things that's incredible about Susan as an actor and having seen this both in One Night in Koreatown and now seeing it again and against time is that she can say the lines and, and, and she means them and, and, it's, and it's the truth and, and everything. But there is so much more going on behind everything that comes out yeah. of her mouth. And in that scene, when she is talking about Alan, when she is talking about what the project means, it, it, there, it, is, it is so loaded. Um, and, and, and it was very moving for me because... Uh, you, you know, I wish I could say 30 years, but really it's probably only about 20 years for 20 years. Now I have held to the belief that Sam told Beth everything, every little detail about the project, about who he was, about what was going to happen, like the whole shebang, because she needed to know that because if things went wrong, she was the one that was going to have to kind of make sure that things stayed yeah. right, basically. So thank you for confirming <laughs> A boy's theory um, and uh I, I i i just was yeah i was so i don't know i i was so moved by that thought can you talk about writing that and uh, just about what that means to you that she was kind of the bearer of all of this for so long well um yeah i mean when you watch the ending of the original series and that title card comes up i don't think anybody watching that show is like well wait now Al and Beth are together, then the whole show's unwritten. I, I don't think anybody has that feeling. Right. It's the feeling yeah. of a retcon, right? It's a retcon that works in concert with the idea of like the adventures still stand, but you know, Al's behavior might have been different as a married man with, you know, all these kids at home. You know, he's probably kvetching about lack of sleep for different reasons than, you know, <laughs> a, a loud neighbor. So 
there's fun stuff there to think about, you know, but, but it, it's, you know, that was the hopeful part of the ending. The, the less hopeful part was the title card that followed. And um, so I, I've always, you know, I think it was my pitch in episode two of season one. Like if we're looking for Janice, can we go to Beth and is Susan available? Will she come? And she's always showed up and never let us down and really carried, you know, I was talking to somebody from, another friend she carries the mia vibes with her she carries mm -hmm. this like emotional history it's very potent if you just tap into it just a little bit so that all was just um really really emotionally viable but also not something i wanted to go for just for member berries you know like remember when this happened like it needs right. to everything has to that i put in the episode has to service this story these characters and the story they're on and it's always tricky when you have legacy characters you know interlap you know overlapping with each other but I felt like this was a, a time thematically and, and plot wise where we needed to acknowledge this piece of the, the old show that nobody would have known about really. Like no one, even Beth doesn't know when, what episode Sam's leaping out of to talk to her, you know, records would just been like, yeah, her and Al are married. Like, it's just not something people would really know about. Not even Al is watching that scene happen. Right. And, uh, and it's changing their own lives, which they're not supposed to do. So that would probably left out of reports. So, you know, it, it might seem like I was just going fan fiction crazy, but I really was just saying, this is what happened. We all treasure this piece of the, the final act of that story. And if it fuels this story, let's use it and let's let it serve the characters in the story we're telling right now. Um, Dean, I want to pivot to you for a second because it's clear and it's been clear to me. I mean, obviously, in, in the conversations that I've been fortunate enough to have with with other writers and, and other folks involved with the show that um, there is clearly a, a a knowledge and and a respect for the classic series um and and what drew just said and how he was able to weave in those threads to to serve this story um is is fantastic but can you talk about the urge or if you ever have to resist the urge to include any of that or is it always are you always able to approach it from the idea of like what's going to serve our story and not just devolve into fan service yeah you know i think for better or for worse, because it had been a while since I, I, I watched the entire original series, but I didn't go back and rewatch it before we started doing the modern one. Mm -hmm. um, I would go back and watch key episodes, but I didn't go back and reimmerse myself in it for two reasons. One, I knew we had a group of us and some of us were super fans. We had some <laughs> writers who, you know, I don't think had seen the original show until they got the job. Um, but I, I tend to find if I focus on the, the story and I'm telling a story to people who have never seen the first Quantum Leap, um, that that's the most satisfying way to entertain that portion of the audience. Um, but, you know, again, I think I've said this in the past. The thing about fictional worlds or fictional universes, are the people who originally construct them, so in this case, basically Deborah, like... If there's an internal logic to their choices, then when you as a writer go in and work in that space, things tie together. You know, pieces pieces make sense. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I loved so much about, about the finale was the fact that really the way the leap, the whole story is successful is that a young boy who has every right to be angry is experiences the power of the program, right? Which basically so few people get to experience. And the power of the program as a positive force is so undeniable that, and especially because he's still young, you know what I mean? And still more open-minded that the power of the program changes how he views the world and what he, you know, and how he wants to approach the world. It's not that suddenly he becomes, he's not Sam Beckett. He's not Sam Beckett's kid. It's not that. It's yeah. just that the, you know, this original idea of someone out there making the world a little better, setting wrong, you know, setting right once or wrong. I just love that that actually became the focus of the season finale. Um, much like I loved that the focus of the last couple of episodes were about bringing Ben and Addison back together because their connection 
you know, I think I've, I've said before, like, Hannah and Ben share a love, a kind of love. You know, we've, we've all had those experiences where you meet someone maybe for one day and you think to yourself, I wonder if in another lifetime, like we were connected because you just feel that connection. But, you know, the idea is Ben and Addison, their love, I think, I think I like in some of our stuff, I'd said like there is the love that actually drives the universe. You know what I mean? That kind of love. Yeah. And so I guess is again, you know, I love my long answers, but this, I really, we all focused on telling that story because frankly, that story, it feels like it grows out of the original series. Do you know what I mean? Like all of these themes that we're talking about, all are themes that resonate with the show I grew up watching and loving. Um, yeah. And so again, I think sometimes we, we look smarter than we are um, or people like Drew make us all appear smarter than we are. Um, I remember when he told me he was including that, you know, that the, their backstory and bringing it full circle. And then, I've, and I immediately flashed back to the transformation in Beth between how we first meet her in season one, where she's, she and Janice are so far at odds that Janice is basically drugging her. And she's saying to Janice, I don't want you anywhere near this program. This yeah. program destroyed lives. And here she is at the end saying, basically echoing magic and saying like, this, no, like, we're saving this. This is worth saving. So again, we didn't, we, we were not sitting around at 103 going, you know, it's going to be great <laughs> of season two. But um, so again, like I just, you know, it was the, the way Drew and the room, because I should say the room helped Drew break the story, like the way they managed to bring kind of just fill it with moment after moment of things I've wanted to see or been waiting to see. Um, you know, I got to see Jeffrey and I got to understand what that was about. I got to sort of see Ben held accountable for what he did with yeah. him for good, better and for worse. You know, like Drew just sort of wrote a, he wrote every scene I personally wanted to see, including probably my, one of my favorite moments, the request permission to leap. Mm -hmm. Just because I, as I always would say to people, I just want to see someone leap who's supposed to leave, <laughs> why they're leaving. I want someone to go in the chamber affirmatively. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, and yeah. that's not that Sam and Ben didn't, but I just was so happy that we got, you know, and by the way, we've only been telling the audience for two years, Addison was supposed to be the leaper. Right. Addison was supposed to be the leaper, right? Like, so, ta-da. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Drew, I, I want to ask one more question about that scene, just specifically to the to the moment I was talking about. What prompted you specifically to have Beth have all of that knowledge and know everything that had that had happened? Like, you know, what was it specifically that said Beth should know everything and Beth needs to be involved in making sure that this project doesn't go down? I think the room. I feel like I'm, I'm trying to remember two seasons that overlapped worth of, of writer's room history. I feel like we would talk in the room about the idea that Beth and or Al would tell Janice bedtime stories about this time traveling angel man, you know, named Sam Beckett. And like, it was, it was this family mythos that became like more than a bedtime story at some point. Um, I think we we there was just something very romantic about that that we all we all liked, and also just it, it felt like logic that that scene doesn't just like end in, in mirror image. It, it's the camera moves away, but there's no like goodbye, Beth. That's all I'm telling you. You know, so part of it's logic, part of it's where do we emotionally follow that ellipsis to? And it felt like it it just it also compounded Janice's rage in season one, right? Like you told me these stories. I built, you know, I worked my whole life to be able to, to finish dad's work and you kept me out and, you know, so it just feels like it's all complicated. And the thing I love about season two of the show, I have to say as a digression, is that Dean and Martin were really interested in complexity and ambiguity this season in ways that you don't always see in network television. And I don't mean like complexity, like he kills people, but he really cares. I mean, complexity, <laughs> like 
you know, can you love more than one person? And can you both hate and love this project that get, took things away, but gave you everything? Can you um, still love someone, even though, you know, you can never be with them and, and can like, and also just the, the ambiguity of some of the things that happen in the finale that we don't give full on answers to. It allows the audience to interact both on a, on a, an ideal level and an emotional level where they're, they're projecting and they're connecting with stuff. And I feel like um, that, that ambiguity and that complexity of the Calavici family and their feelings about all this stuff is, is, is just as interesting as the nature of what Ben and Addison can be for each other this season. And I, I also think like, you know, something I think is even better this season than last is last season was really all about this one mystery. And as you mentioned before, like this season has these three beautiful movements, you know, these three, you know, stories within the story that each one is is opening and unveiling itself like Russian nesting dolls. And I, and each one is full of really, you know, it's, it's complex. Ben and Addison's relationship in the first third is really complex. They both feel like a lot of feelings about what happened and, and Addison's both punishing herself and defending herself and guilty, but also a little indignant. So it's just like, these were very adult ways to go after this stuff. And, you know, we talked about Tom, is he bad? Is he just, no, he's going to be somebody who is just, person of sound character and a good heart. And yet that doesn't mean that he can't get his heart broken because once Ben shows up, this, everything starts to, to fracture. Um, you know, I just think there were a lot of bold choices made this season in the storytelling from the top. And, and it allowed us to, talk, to just really dig in in ways that were very human amidst the fantasy of what, what this time traveling guardian angel show is, is about. I, I love that you use the word humanity because I think that the humanity of the season has been something that I've connected with, you know, since the, the first episode of the season, quite frankly, and it's only grown. And it's one of the reasons why these last couple of episodes have been so moving and so touching is because that, that humanity is such a huge part of it. Um, there's a specific scene in Against Time, and we'll talk a little bit more about other parts because this is later on in the episode, but I, I wanted to talk about this one in, in particular because it is so important. And I think it speaks to a lot of what you're saying about the fact that this is a different kind of show in so many ways and asks some very mature questions and does it with such care and with such love um, that it, it makes the show feel so different and so necessary compared to anything else on the television landscape. And I've, and I've hedged my bets a lot when I've said that in the past, quite frankly, and I'll say that with both of you right here. I usually say network television, you know, because it's true. There's nothing like this show on network television, but I'm willing to go the, the step further and say there's literally nothing like this show uh, on the television landscape. And one of the scenes that drove that home for me um, incredibly in this episode is when they finally get to Hannah and Jeffrey's house and Ben has the hammer and is getting ready to smash the computer. Um, and, you know, and Addison's told them, you do this and everything's fixed. And he doesn't do it. Um, it it's one of the most beautiful moments of the episode and in an episode that's full of them. And Drew, before I ask you about it, Dean, I want to ask you, when you read the script and when you when you first recognized this moment, how did it make you feel and what did you think about it? You know, I remember when we were breaking it as a room, we, you know, we, we knew, okay, we're going to make it a leap where we're going to, Ben is going to have to convince Jeffrey in the past. And then we started talking about devices and ways you could do that and whether we wanted it to be a thing or, you know, like an actual device or a trick or whatever, you know, does it, do you break the computer? Is it? and how we didn't want it to be that. So I think it started from a place of, we don't want it to be, let's break his computer. And then someone amongst us, you know, said like, well then let's, let's make that the goal that Ben realizes is not the right goal. Um, so I think thematically that scene made sense to me. I thought it was gonna be a good scene, a strong scene. But the way Chris Grismer directed it, the way Drew, the things Drew chose to write after that moment, which I think informs that moment and, and sort of makes it more powerful. Um, the performance from both, you know, from both young Jeffrey and from Ray, that, that just came together in a way, to, you know, me more powerful than I expected. And, and that, that moment when he realizes he named it after his dad. 
this one of those moments, it's silly to say, it like I, it, that one sort of, I get a little catch in me every time I see it. Um, and I, again, what I, what I love is that we stay consistent to our idea that it is not ultimately one action and especially not a negative action that is going to make the world a better place. That if you just expose people to the feeling or the fabric or even the idea, because it later in that scene, he basically Ben more or less says like, don't help me help, help save a life. Yeah. Help someone not go through what you're going to go through. Sorry, Drew, I'm maybe taking all your answer, but no, no, no. <laughs> it's just, you know, it ends up being in a way, I think the fulcrum of the whole episode yes. um, is that moment. And it's even, we even drop the music out um, at that moment, just to, to try to create a catch your breath, even technically. Yeah. Um, Drew, talk about <laughs> no, 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 that, you, you, you put it all beautifully. I mean, I, I would say that um, on a on a pure storytelling, like mathematical level, what I was excited to do was make this like the hardest leap on Ben in every way possible. Right. Because the harder the obstacle, the, the better the hero um, rises to an occasion. And so stranding him with no team and not and and Jeffrey in full control of everything and feeling totally lost and, and, and echoing certain feelings from 201, which is fun too. Like it feels like isolated and what's he gonna do and how's he gonna, he's gonna have to do this all by himself. But when it came to that scene, what was exciting to me was okay, we've seen Ben give a speech in the show many a time, right? And and it usually solves the problem. And what interested me was like, well, can it can it be even harder than that? Can it be even harder to work? Because I think if Ben had given that speech and left, I don't know that would have been enough. I think Jeffrey would have thought about it for a day and then gone back to his, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that's not enough. This is the hardest leap. It has to feel like, you know, it's the finale. It has to feel truly uh, a superhuman feat to pull this all off, to do to save everybody. And what's great too is what comes before that moment is Jen's death, right? And so Jen's death accelerates the momentum into that moment with a hammer which is just like, let's fucking do, sorry, excuse my language, let's do this and go because he killed our friend, you know? He yeah. killed our friend, he's stolen this technology, he deserves this, and maybe he does, right? But that's where the true test of a leaper comes in, right? Because this, the true superpower of the show and of the character in both shows, I think, is empathy, right? That is really, to me, in a nutshell, what the show's always been about. And so to see Ben connect with that part of himself after he's been challenged. What's great about the episode too, I think is that he's being challenged. Why are you the lead of the show? You know, like you're not, you're not supposed to be the new guy. You're not supposed to be the guy you, you weren't supposed to be. And you, you don't know what you're doing. And it's like an angry troll on the internet saying hashtag not my quantum leap, you know, but what's great is that Ben is going to, is going to take us to the edge of despair and back into the full uh, era of victory because he knows he feels on an intrinsic level. This doesn't feel right. I have to actually connect with this kid. And what's beautiful about the season that I wanted to really hammer home in the finale is if Ben hadn't lost three years, if he hadn't had his heart broken, if he and Addison weren't torn apart, if he hadn't had to meet her new lover and realize that he was never coming home, if he hadn't gone through all of that in conjunction with everything that happened to him as a kid with his mom and his dad, he would not have the tools to get, his, get that connection made in that moment and get that kid in the car to do the, the, the final act, which is it's going to be the doing, the dramatized, you know, showing and not telling of actually being a leaper, whether you can time travel or not, that's going to save everybody. So that's my long roundabout answer for why the scene plays out as it does, because I felt like we can make this feel like I think this the, Bennett feels so heroic this episode and he never throws a punch. And yeah. I'm not opposed to that. I had him punch a Nazi, but I thought it was like, how do we make him feel like... Odysseus here, with, 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 but but still retain what the show really is about, even as the dark and gritty reboot threatens to take over the episode. Right, right. Um, well, one of the things too that that is that is remarkable about that, um, and now to kind of jump back, uh, which I guess is appropriate for a show that has time travel in it, but the you know the conversation between Ben and Gideon, um, and we haven't talked a lot 
at all about Gideon yet, and, and we will. But one of the things ab about that conversation is that it's clear that Ben recognizes in that moment there is no reasoning with this human being. I, I can't change Gideon. Right. And so it makes that later scene all the more remarkable because Ben realizes, but maybe I can save Jeffrey. Right. And, and, and like you said, you know, does it through not just words, but action, because it's like, because it, it, it's not, it's not enough to say like, I do a lot of good and you can help me do a lot of good, but it's like, you're going to save a life today. Yeah. You're going to feel what that feels like. Um, and, and, and so it works, but in, in writing that scene, um, and, and, and we could talk a little bit more about Gideon in general in just a second, but in writing that scene between Ben and Gideon, which is phenomenal and both Ray and, and James are fantastic yeah I, I i had said to you off the record at one point that i didn't think that gideon was beyond redemption like there were there was there was there were a couple little things that i had seen of gideon before that i was like oh maybe maybe he can be redeemed and then after this scene i remember just thinking like nah he's satan um <laughs> so can you tell me a little bit about that scene and and, yeah. and and just you know again kind of you know creating this character who does seem to now be beyond all redemption and will yeah. commit other acts throughout the episode, including the murder of Jen that, yeah. that reinforce that. Yeah. So what was really wild about that scene was I think when I was writing that 10 and 11, were both undergoing some significant reworking and rewriting. And so in essence, there was no voice for Gideon that was finalized in a script when I was writing that scene. What was finalized, and I will I will continue to, to give this man props, but Dean is so his his training and his focus is so rooted in character that he created pieces of material all throughout the season that no viewer has seen or will ever see, but we did, right? So Dean wrote a beautiful one pager explaining both for the network and for the actor and whoever else needs to read it, who is our big bad and who is he really? And how does he move through the world? And how does he treat people? And, and what kind of what kind of quirks does he have? And we talk again. This is what I'm not just blowing smoke. Like it's it's not everybody can communicate what they want in an efficient and clear manner to their staff. But what what I felt from Martin and Dean was very clear was this guy is, has a casual cruelty in him. You know this mm. this sort of flippant trollish kind of like is he fucking with you? Is he not? You don't know. It doesn't matter to me, but it, clearly it does. So that, like, between that one pager and, and those discussions, that stuff felt, like, really um, visceral and fun to play with. But it wasn't until I sat down and started writing it that I, um, the line came to me, uh, you're not very good at this, are you? Hmm. And when I, when that popped in, it was like, I had his whole point of view, yeah. which was like, you're, from my perspective, you are a um, incompetent, negligent uh disaster of, of uh, you don't deserve this power at all like you i'm gonna give you what you always wanted i'm gonna send you home that's what you want right that's why you did this was like get at us and go back home you're not trying to save the world and from this perspective which we don't i don't know if the original series ever really did this but like to go from a person's perspective outside of the leaper and to show the sort of borderline disgusting disquieting feeling of this the stranger this faceless stranger keeps popping up in your life seducing your mother, causing your father's death, lying and manipulating you, you know, that is, that gives him a case and a point of view that is really strong. And it's better to have an antagonist with a strong point of view than just like, I want her to take over the world. Like he, it, it all funnels through that pain. Yeah, I mean, what's, just to jump on, on why I think what Drew did was so successful. Um, you know, we'd met Jeffrey and we'd seen these incidental moments. Do you know what I mean? Like we actually, as an audience member, uh, we met Josh. You know what I mean? Like we, mm -hmm. we, 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 we saw Jeffrey through two phases of his life, including being rescued, right? It like, but also being very unhappy that he's there in that apartment building. So it's not simply, thun, thun, thun. 14 episodes ago, you did this one thing. Right. It's, you know, the idea was in 13, we were going to bring Hannah's story full, like we were going to see the full arc of Hannah's story, including how her own worldview, which we established in all the way back in 203, right? Her own sort of positive worldview is the reason that she 
chooses to do what she does. It's why she believes him in 206. It's why, you know what I mean? Like, so yeah. we were going to bring her story full circle. And then the idea that, okay, well, that's great. But, but nothing in this universe, you know, as, as, you don't get it. My, my friend says, like, God doesn't give it two hands and all the versions of that expression. It's like even the best choices and the most noble things have ripple effects and consequences. And so the fact that this seemingly beautiful relationship, which is going to do something very profoundly good, it did create a negative. Yeah. And like we've got to clean that negative up before you get to go through your next adventure with two, with you and Addison. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, you've got to, you, you, you've got to fix this. And you, and, and I, I, um, I think that's what makes it, at least that's what made it work for me when I experienced, you know, when I watched it, like I, you know, I'm, I tend to be pretty cynical about certain things. So like the first time, well, we'll change Jeffrey's heart and that will change the future. I'm the kind of person to be sort of like, Wah, wah, wah. Like, I, like I worried that 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 we won't earn it. You know what I mean? I want like I think so much of what this season was about. And going back to even your first question is like we wanted the character the characters to earn everything. Yeah. And that's not necessarily something you ask the audience to go along with either. Yeah. You know. Um, and so I think, but I again I remember when. You know, Drew just found so many things in that scene. Like when James, who plays Gideon, says, I learned it from you. I learned being the faceless guy who's going to change things selfishly without caring. Guess who, who? I got that idea from you, big man. Yeah. And I just, I remember when I read that and then when we were on set and James performed that, I just, it gave me a chill yeah. because I, it just was, I was like, wow, I hadn't thought about it, but yeah, he did learn it from Ben, didn't he? Yeah. It's interesting. You know, I, I recently <clears throat> stumbled across this, this clip, uh, you know, the algorithm sent it my way for whatever reason. And um, <laughs> Colin Farrell is being interviewed by Jamie Lee Curtis and uh, they're talking about sobriety. And one of the things that Colin Farrell says, I know that there are two certainties in this world. You're going to die and you're going to make mistakes. And one of the things that this season, and the reason why that resonated with me in connection to this season and to Quantum Leap in general, is I feel like both of those things are on display throughout the course yeah. of the season. And it comes full circle in such a beautiful way because the mistakes that our heroes make and the ripple effect that they have, like you were saying, are, 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 are not necessarily just black and white. You did something yeah. bad. You know, it's, 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 it's in some cases, it's like you did something good maybe for the wrong reason, or maybe you did something bad for the right reason or whatever the case might be. And I think the maturity of that, being able to ask such a big question of that, of the audience in such a way that says like, Hey, you know, will you go with us, especially up to this point when we learn that some of the things that our hero does and that, and that Hannah does and that, that have this profound effect that creates this monster basically. And I, I hate to you know, reduce it to that, but creates this monster that then threatens the existence of, of all of this. Um, and I, and I, I just think that that's, it, it is kind of a big ask, but it's, but it's a wonderful ask and it's a, and it's a lovely thing because I think again, what it all brings us back to is that is, is, is love and hope and empathy, um, you know, being the, the superpower that, that we all have, you know, that everyone has. And, and, and if we can choose that, then how can anything truly go wrong? Um, which, which, you know, I want to, I want to talk about Hannah and I want to talk more about Jeffrey, obviously, but I want to talk about Hannah before we do. And because I, I think that it's no overstatement to say that Hannah has been an incredibly popular character, that Eliza's performance has been absolutely wonderful, that she's been incredibly, you know, written from the get go. Um, we talked a little bit about this before, but obviously we couldn't go into much detail because, you know, it was six or seven episodes ago. Uh, Dean, can you talk specifically about the genesis of the character? And in particular, there's there's a letter that you wrote from Addison's point of view or from from Hannah's point of view to Addison. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and about the fact that this is over a year ago? That, that that all of this was you know was yeah. happening while season one was still being produced. I want to remind everyone. So, so basically, just to, to wind it back, you know, I'll start by saying, give me romantic 
epic romantic drama any day of the week. Like <laughs> the Hannah Ben story, like is right in my particular, like I'm fascinated with stories like that, like going yeah. back to some of the movies I did. But, you know, Martin had come up with the time leap and we started talking about Hannah as a character. And he actually was telling me, like he referenced Impossible Girl. You know, he re- we were talking about different shapes of her, time traveler's yeah. wife. Um, and it was still really early on and Martin and I, I think it just hung up and I was going for a jog and I just kind of was thinking about Hannah as a character and I was thinking about, I knew where we were going to, I knew she was going to create the formula. Like that's all we knew, right? We knew there was going to be a love story and she was going to create the formula. And it just came, like, I just started listening to her. And then I thought about like, what would she, how would she basically, what would her last communication with Addison be? Sorry that I'm not being more articulate about this. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember it. And, and so I wrote a letter from Hannah and I think it was, I wasn't, she wasn't even named Hannah yet at like age a hundred, basically to Addison explaining what it was like, basically what her, what Hannah's life was like in terms of, she watched Addison be born. She thought about breaking them up. Like it was just, it was a way to get my, sink my teeth into the character. And then I just was like, I said into Martin, and he's like, you should send this to the writers. Like, this is like, you know, and I was like, okay, like it seems a little schmaltzy, but maybe not. Um, <laughs> what's funny is um, how much we all ended up like we did stick to that. I will say I didn't realize how much we stuck to it until Drew asked me about it the other day. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's look, it's, it's, you know, writer's tip, like some of the best stuff you can do is write material that's not going to be shot. Mm-hmm. Great way to find your characters. It's a great way to help your actors, you know, mm-hmm. before 213 and 212. I, we gave that to Eliza. Do you know what I mean? So to give her a sense, because we were talking about how we wanted her to feel in 213, you know, which is a, it's a big ask because she's both sad because she knows her chapter is coming to a close in a way. She's happy because she knows she's going to actually, in her, I think she knows yeah. exactly what's going to happen. Um, and and so anyway, long story short, um, yeah, we wrote, I wrote a letter uh, and emailed it to the to team and then they turned it into the amazing character you saw. <laughs> it's, started, I mean, it's starting mainly in 206, frankly, like, I mean, we did, you know, we had her in 203 um, and those scenes were short, but I, I mean, I remember when Drew sent us 206 thinking to myself, I was like, oh, this is great. Like we all see the same Hannah. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think that 203 certainly accomplishes that effect of, of, of drawing you in, you know, getting the hooks in, but then yeah, six obviously gives you a fuller picture and, 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 and shows you who this person is and why this relationship will be important. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, that Hannah knows exactly what's going to happen. There is a really funny, uh, line about, um, in reference to 212 having been the last time that they'll ever see one another. Hannah tells Ben that. And then, of course, they see one another again. And towards the end of 213, you know, Ben jokes about that, about her, uh, the math being off. And uh, I just started to wonder uh, two things. One, uh, was it? And, and, and if it wasn't, then obviously that means that her math for the formula isn't off either. So what happens at the end is exactly what's supposed to happen. So Drew, I'll throw that one to you. Yeah. Talk about the math being off. <laughs> well, here's why rewatching the season will be of uh, great value, I think. <laughs> if you go back in the last, really just to 12, I suppose, everyone starts calling it a swap code. Hannah does not. Hannah calls it a quantum code to Ben. That's what she says. It's a quantum code to bring you home where you belong. Yeah. Uh, that's what she says. So everybody else has, has you know, Ian and, and uh, has, has ideas of what, what the code's supposed to do and how it's supposed to work. Um, 
There was some dialogue in the final scene that might have been a little bit more definitive between Ben and Addison that thankfully, even as the writer of the episode, I was thinking we took out because it let the moment just breathe and be. Yeah. I think it's open to interpretation what you want it to believe. Did it go wrong? Did it go right? That's up to the viewer, I think, to decide. One of the many interactive elements, I think, of the season is, is, is again, we keep talking about complexity and, you, you know, good things coming from bad and best intentions and all. I think this is one of those examples where it's up to you what you decide, you know. But, uh, you know, I think that, I think that this is the, there's a gift Hannah wanted to give to Ben, and I feel like whether it's her intention or not, she delivers on it in the, in the finale. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, let me just amend good. so that I, cause I, I don't want people to. I should never say that I think it's gospel the certain way. <laughs> what I will say is this. I, what I think is certain is that Hannah knew that the relationship between Ben and Addison was absolutely crucial yeah. to bringing Ben home. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think... And I, so, which is why she's so confident in that final scene. You know, something I remember that yeah. night when we were filming it, it was the second to last night. Is that right, Drew? Yeah, I think so. Second to last night. And that scene actually is a good example of, we made changes. Hmm. Drew and I we were there and we, like the, glad the math was wrong. I don't think that line was in the script originally, Drew. I'm, I like it was, it was a little harsher. It was like, I figured your math was off. And you were yeah. like, it's a little dickish. Can it be, yeah. I was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but like Jeez, we, man, what add, a dick. we added a few things. I'm pretty sure we added the nomad line. Mm. Actually, what, what Dean, Dean and Al. So this is what's cool. I, I, this was such a great. I just have to say, making this episode was one of the most wonderful moments of my life because it was. I just had a baby at home, so like the second week we didn't have any help at home, so I had to leave and go back at night, and so I couldn't be there till wrap. So, but Dean and Alex were on set that night when we were going to shoot. Beth, ben and, and Hannah's goodbye, and I was getting ready to leave. But we we rehearsed it, and we had made some adjustments because the tone of that scene was super tricky. Right. If it's too romantic, it hurts what's coming next. If it's too abrupt, it's not satisfying. We hadn't quite found the right balance. And when they ran it, even I could tell from Eliza, she was like she was missing something, you know, something just that touches on their history without an overwhelming scene. And Alex and Dean together we're like we spent a lifetime in seven days and it was just like that's that's going in and we texted Eliza like add put we're putting this in and it just touched on the value of the time they'd spent together without detracting from what she was there to do which is to send him back it was just to, to, to let go in in the most yeah. generous and loving way well I mean I think from I, I was I was stealing from myself because that was in the original letter like, like she, she, she says to Addison that, you know, she had been for seven days, but in a way she had him for her whole life. Um, but I just to echo what Drew said about that, the tone of that scene and just, you know, to expand our scope a little. It was actually an example of when your studio and network partners, you know, people are like people like to bemoan the process a lot. And sometimes it's tough. But, you know, just to say, first of all, again, to remind everyone, the studio and the network let us do this time jump and yeah. this radical change. And there they had almost no notes on the script, which is a testimony to Drew. But their one note was saying, like, watch the tone in this scene, because if it's too romantic, as exactly what Drew mm -hmm. said. So that was an example of a third party flagging something um, and, and sort of keeping us on the lookout for it. You know, and, and I think, look, ultimately what, what ended up on screen and what got cut out, like Drew said, I think it does a nice job of, of, of bringing a story to close. And I should say, like, also, some part of her knows, I mean, she knows, I'm assuming Jeffrey called her and basically said, Mom, you won't believe this. I'm at the racetrack. I'm with Ben. Yeah. I did a leap with him. I saved someone. And so she also is there knowing that, like, Ben, as a time traveler, has helped her son. She doesn't know what the future was going to be like for her son, right. but she knows that he made a difference. And, 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 you know, that was not a moment that we actually got to go into detail about and talk about. Like, it, it wasn't right for the flow of the episode. But I, that's one of those things I thought was really beautiful because, like, 
if if you have any doubt about what you the choices you've made in your life to see your son be touched by the project in a way that you feel like is going to make him a positive force going forward after three or four years of really challenging times where you're blaming yourself. You know what I mean? Like that was just, again, sometimes we look smarter than we are like that. <laughs> that realization was really profound, at least to me. I was like, well, it's really nice. Like Ben helped Hannah just like she helped Ben. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think just to, to go back to the math off, I mean, from my interpretation, I think that we see, you know, we see Hannah in 206 solving equations that, you know, these, these geniuses can't solve apparently at Princeton, you know, we, we see her coming up with this DARPA code, which uh, it looks like could possibly be finished because she's got it at her apartment in, in 212. She's, you know, writing equations on the fly in the in the ash and, and dirt of the floor in 212 as she's in pain. She has this beautiful scene with Addison where she talks about the bonds between two people and about how sometimes they're, you know, stretched far apart, but they always come back together. She tells Ben specifically, you know, that 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 home isn't a place, it's a person. So for me, yeah, I think that, you know, Hannah's gift is recognizing two things that we've been told this season. One, the nature of quantum leap is sacrifice. Sacrifice. And that and, and that and that we know from Sam Beckett's adventure that likely Ben's never getting back to, to home. Now, maybe, maybe, but 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 at least from my understanding right now, it doesn't look like it. And so the only way to really put Ben back home is to get Addison out there with him. So that's that's my my spiel. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to, to, to ask about, too, when it comes to uh, uh, the, the nature of the season and especially these last five episodes is that sacrifice fate and loss have been such a a, a, a um a, a you know such a theme running through uh, all of these episodes and it certainly i feel like culminates in in a way with the scene between ben and jeffrey which is post you know nearly breaking the computer like you were talking about earlier dean and there's this you know this moment where it echoes some of the stuff in 212 that ben has already said to jeffrey but he takes it one step further and it's not just about loss anymore. It's about the idea that like there are some there are some losses that we can't change, that we can't do anything about. And that's real. That's real life. That's not science fiction. That's not quantum leap. Right. But but maybe today you can help me save a life. And, and and again, that's real. That's true. That's honest. And I think that one of the things that was so moving to me amongst many, many other things is that in the midst of this fantastic story that is being told is that this genuine piece of, of knowledge of thought of feeling is being shared between these two characters that so desperately need to hear that because obviously Ben, you know, I mean, could talk all day about the nature of Ben's own sense of loss and mourning and grief, but Jeffrey's is clearly palpable and recent. Um, Drew, I'll ask you first, you know, in, in, in writing that scene, um, it feels incredibly personal. Yeah. Uh, where did that come from and what does it mean to you? Uh, that's a big question. Um, I think if I'm going to be super specific, I would say that like what's very powerful to me about it or personal to me about it is uh, Jeffrey is sort of standing in for a lot of fatherless boys out there who need someone to offer some guidance and some kind of security, some kind of, of wisdom to them that they're not getting um, because the things we go through have, we don't, you know, it, there are cycles we repeat and there are cycles we can break, right? And there was something very beautiful to me about someone coming to him and saying that you have a choice. You know, you don't have a choice about what happens to you but you have a choice of how you respond and how you move through the world. And there have been people in my life who showed up when I didn't have anybody there who were like, I know that you, you've got these defense mechanisms, but you don't have to be that. That's not even who you are. You know, there's something inside of you that's not, you know, angry or defensive or um, needs to attack. There's a part of you that's very pure that you need to protect with that, you know? And so, there was something beautiful about talking about the narratives we choose when we come out of traumatic situations, when we come out of loss, we have choices of how we choose to look at what our life means and what we're here to do. And, and, and what, what is the wisdom we get from trauma or from suffering or from loss? And, and the, the strongest one to me is 
through that, you can connect with and be there for other people who share that situation. You know, you can be um, a spouse that you didn't see in your house growing up. You can have that relationship. You can be the parent you didn't have growing up. You can be the friend you wish you had when things were really dark. You have the ability to pay it back what you didn't get. And that's, I think, one of our first talks here, Sam, I talked about how I love that about Ben is that he's giving these people something he did not have. He will give people the, the reconciliation, the return, the, the healing that he never got. And that's what makes for an incredible human being, both on screen and in real life. And so for me, I feel like I've been able to um, come through some of those things. And, and thanks to certain people and certain choices that I had to make. And seeing Ben offer that to that kid, to me, felt like a way to communicate with the audience, right? Because we are all seeing things happen every day and going through things that really can chip away at our own humanity and our own our hearts and souls, you know? And so it's important to be reminded that we, every day we get up, we have a choice. We can make the world a little bit better or a little bit worse. And there's big stuff we can't change. When we read the news every day of what's going on in the world, it's horrible. It's just horrible. There are families being destroyed, separated kids being mutilated. It's awful what's going on in the world right now. And we feel powerless. But if we go outside, we can help anybody and we can make a difference this small and it's not this small. That's what the show has always been saying. I think it's like those lives touch others. And so it spoke to the themes of the show, but for me, it was an important, it was an important thing to express that I believe is real, you know, and, and especially in light of some of the things that we as a community have gone through losing Matt, it took on even more resonance because we, we, he was an example, you know, he really was an example in a lot of ways and we are still all trying to be one um, as best we can. You know, one of the things about that sequence that I, I, you know, one of the interesting things about the job that Drew and I have is you write certain pieces or certain stretches and, and in your mind, you might think it's going to be performed one way. And then the actor performs it slightly differently or brings a different energy to it or emphasizes a different moment. And I remember when the way Ben says time is a thief, hmm. like there is such an honest anger about his assessment of time, you know, and I was thinking about why, like why that resonated for me. And I realized I'm like, oh, because that was the whole point. I would go back to podcast we did at the start of the year. But one of our ideas was we want to take the audience through how much it hurts to be a time traveler. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, not just, oh, I can't get back to my honey. Like, and not, again, that's great for a while. But, like, we want them to hurt, to feel it. And and I think where I'm going with this is, you know, what's so remarkable about Ray is that he was drawing on his journey, Ben's journey. And he found an anger in the time as a thief that I remember when I read Drew and I knew I sort of thought how he would say it, but he said it with just more vitriol and more certainty to the point where I was like, Oh, he really does think time is a thief. Like this is, this is time stinks sometimes period. Not going to tell you otherwise. And that was, and again, just to emphasize my point, that's one of the things that's great about what Drew and I do is that you have someone like Raymond who, nails that moment mm -hmm. and, and nails a moment that you, you didn't necessarily know how it was going to play. And it, to me, that was sort of the culmination of his entire season two. Like yeah, yeah. it was 202, 203, yeah. 204. Like all of that came out in that moment, you know, which is just shortly after he's told Addison, you know, like you didn't, you didn't make a mistake waiting. So I think like, yeah, yeah. anyway, just to say, that was um, another example of what I hope, what we all hope an audience will take from the season as a whole. Yeah. I also think that this is, again, the advantage of what we get to do. Our show is different from the original, but like we have character development ongoing week to week in a serialized level. And so you can really bring all the history of these characters that they all remember because with the Swiss cheese brain has ended, that, that chapter's ended. So 
what's what's exciting for me at the finale is that every episode we wrote this season, you feel it into 213. Like you feel all those fights between Ben and Addison. You feel him being lost and needing someone in 201. You feel, you know, like uh, Addison and, and struggling with her purpose and what am I meant to do? All that stuff is feeding the, sto- the, the, the journey these characters on, are on. And, and you are both where they reference and what they perform, what you just, you remember as a viewer, you can feel it all under the surface and it's feeding all these decisions they're making in these critical moments. So it, it's, I'm, I went back and looked at a lot of our scripts when I was writing 213. I looked at Nomad, I looked at everything because all, every writer and, and our show owners, their fingerprints are on the DNA of the show and the, that's, that's the clay is being molded episode by episode. So there was so much to draw on that 13's job is easier because of all these great stories we told this season that advance these characters to where they are at this exact moment. Yeah, I you know to that just real quick. One of the things that as I've watched it and as I've again you know had the pleasure of being able to speak to you guys and and, and others, certainly there are some things that I recognize. You, you know, as I'm watching an episode, it might stand out and be like, oh, you know, that's that's so and so's voice. You know, I can I can kind of hear that or whatever. But for the most part, like one of the things that's remarkable about this season and so remarkable about the finale is is like it's quantum leap. You know, like yeah, it's you, Drew, and it's remarkable, and you're amazing. But like, it's it's not it's not a Drew Lindo script. It's it's a quantum leap script. You know what I mean? And it's and it's lovely because of that. Because of like you're saying, like it has those fingerprints. It has all. It's so informed by the collaborative process that has been ongoing since last February. You know, <laughs> since you guys had to start doing this right away, um, which is which is just remarkable. Um, one of the other things that you talked about too is the the choices that the characters make and. One of the things about the episode that stood out to me, and I remember watching it, I watched it uh, Saturday night, and then uh, on Sunday morning, I was sitting there and, and, and I was just sitting next to my son, and I just thought to myself all of a sudden, I was like, wow, did, did he cheat a little bit? You know, did, did, did Drew cheat a little bit? And, and, and then the way that things got resolved, because there were these powerful choices and decisions made by these characters and the sense of sacrifice and in the end. And then, and then I stopped and I was like, no, because the remarkable thing about the episode and the reason why it doesn't feel like a cheat at all is because we learn so much about who these people are in this crucible of this episode about Jen, about magic, about Ian and, you know, and have for the past few episodes that even though those events that might've pushed them to make some of the choices they make don't occur now because of the change to Gideon's past, they would still do every single one of those things. Jen would still sacrifice herself for the good of the team. You know, Ian would still stand up to Tom and, and tell Tom, I did, you know, everything I did, I did for the right reason, I would do it all again. And, and, it, and it's remarkable because we get this, like, this glimpse into these characters' lives that even though the situations that put them into that position may no longer occur due to this change, it still tells us who they are as human beings, which is pretty incredible. Can you talk about the choice to, to push them to that extreme, to, to, yeah. to literally kill off one of our main characters and then, and then yet be able to undo it. And yet it still all carries so much weight and not feel like a cheat. Technically I killed five of them, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. True. True. I don't think it's speaking out of school to say that, that Dean you know, our showrunners take passes on scripts and add stuff. And, and some Dean added a 204 that just stuck in my craw forever was what if the date, what if the engine of quantum leap is sacrifice? Mm-hmm. I believe it's what Tom said. And it was, a, and, and he said it to magic, right? Yeah. And magic is also somewhat philosophical, somewhat of a spiritual character that was so wrapped up in my brain. And so, um, I think what we, we knew we had the ability to, to really go, to the mattresses with stakes because of the nature of a, a butterfly effect story. So we knew we we're going to do that, but also we knew that, um, you know, I, I always want to give everyone a great moment when I'm writing an episode. I don't want to feel like this is just, you know, just another episode. I want to give everybody something special to do. So it felt like Jen is given the task of protecting quantum leap and taking over in 12 and she's the head of security. So like if someone's going to play, you know, if someone's gonna be the last soldier on the hill to go down, um, it should be Jet. Like if that if that's who it should be. And similarly to that, you know, Magic says Magic sort of is is calling back to what Tom said in four in this episode when they asked him, "What do we do now? If we're risking our own erasure by doing this, should we continue?" Right? And Magic is saying, "We have to trust in something bigger than ourselves." 
even if we lose. And what's cool about it, I think, is like that's quantum leap in a nutshell, right? Like the universe, God, fate, time, or whatever, it doesn't always play nice. Like it sometimes it gives Sam a win. Sometimes it takes a life for a life. Sometimes it he's got a you know a lot of life is never just happily ever after. It, there's always a cost or or a, you know compromise or something. So it felt like to to see all these characters. It especially Beth and Janice, who were given a whole new history, to then sacrifice their own, to sacrifice themselves before, for something bigger and something greater that, that needs to continue to exist, um, felt right for the season and the story we've been telling. And also it moved me, this idea of them all. Um, what's really powerful to me is Magic says, well, how far are we prepare to go? When the guns are on Jen, he asks her to stand down. Like, even yeah. for him... That's too much, right? So by the time we get to the very end, you know, they are resigned. They are uh, proud to have done this together. And they are going out and facing the music as a family and as a team. And, and you know, it, on one hand, everything's better. On another hand, what happened happened. You know, like it's those iterations of them are, took that bullet for, for, for the greater good. So it just felt like spiritually right for this story we've been telling which, by the way, I think Dean and Martin really did go further into these larger questions this season in a way we did not in season one. And these are questions you cannot answer because unless you bring Morgan Freeman or Bruce McGill down, no one comes down and says, I'm God, here's what I'm thinking or feeling. <laughs> but our characters choosing what to believe, what their narrative is, again, like Jeffrey and Magic, that's, that's the choice we all make. We choose whether we see reason to this universe or chaos and what we want to believe in uh, when we get up out of bed every morning. So... All of that stuff just felt right for the story and and beautiful for each character to to take that that risk. Yeah, I, you, you know, you mentioned the the earlier you, you talked, you, you kind of quoted Al the bartender's lines about you know your life touched others and that others and others and and I think that one of the things is you know we see that butterfly effect achieved on the screen behind Ian and and the circle of them holding hands there and 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 the FX just kind of like this idea that like the world is 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 leaping around them you know that they're not yeah. leapy but that the world is leaping and changing and they're holding hands and it is this beautiful moment and this beautiful picture of sacrifice and one of the things that I love that it did is it echoed something that I felt like did not necessarily get finished, if you will, in, in, in Judgment Day, which is the notion that that future Ian did the same exact thing that they're doing. You know, they gave up their existence in order for the world to be a better place in, in the past. And now the group, the collective gets to do that same thing. And because it kind of echoed that in a way, it felt like it finished a moment, you know, finished a beat in season one that never felt all the way, you know, complete for me personally. So it was it was it was a lovely moment. And it and again, it it did this wonderful thing that. In the future, these characters, when backs against the wall, you know, you now know like what they're capable of, yeah. and it's and it's really it's really great. Um, Dean, for you, seeing the extremes to the, the, the characters are you know pushed to in these in these last few episodes, and and obviously specifically with you know Jen's on screen death. Um, can you talk a little bit about? what that meant in the picture of the whole season and especially as these characters developed because one of the things that i've said is like there's no MacGuffin this season there's no smoke monster there's no you know what i mean it's about these human beings so seeing them push to that absolute limit was very moving for me what did it yeah. mean to you as a writer as a creator i think i think the, the way to answer is to say what it meant to us as a room but i think as a room you know, again, if you wind back to like the 201 podcast or whatever we did, you know, we said we want to tell you and show you more about this, these characters that we have. And, you know, it, what I was very happy was we got to see a defining moment. Some people got more than one, but defining moments for characters. Yeah. Um, you know, we got to see that the, the, the part of magic that's so darn magic, like, <laughs> guess what? There's a human side to him too. And, uh, you know, we got to see with Ian, what I love what we saw about them is they carried this guilt and this secret. And finally in this cathartic eruption that Margarita wrote, you know, the, basically the, like, I'm sorry for zero, like, 
you want to judge me? I'm the person who did, I would do this every time. <laughs> and, and, and then, and so we were very conscious that we had not seen that for Jen. We had always talked about as a room, what we were going to, you know, and we kept coming up with ways to sort of graft it into an episode. Maybe she goes to an old hacker friend and gets a red, but they never felt satisfying because, because yeah. they weren't stakesy enough. They felt, you know, and so when everyone decided that we were going to kill her, um, it just felt so earned. Again, I'm using the word earned a lot, but I believed it. I believed, I believed that she would go. And the way I remember when I read the script, the way Drew wrote it, the intercutting, uh, it, it just, it really walloped me yeah. because, and what I loved about it was on the one hand, I'd like to think the audience is going to say, well, she's not actually going to get shot. Right. Like, and then right. she does. So we experienced the shock of like, oh boy, this quant, these, these crazy people behind this. <laughs> like, like, wow. Nobody's safe. Um, so we, you know, we experience that as an audience and then we do get the, the sort of the, I don't know if you want to call it a MacGuffin. I mean, I like, I can wrap, I get dizzy thinking about who's different, how they might be different. Are they different? <laughs> are we the same? I, but I, you know, what was amazing about what Drew was able to squeeze in that script is I got to see Ian's humor, which is, you know, one of the most important things that they bring to the show and to the actual characters. I got to see magic, put his money where his mouth is and give, and, and I got to see Jen be the person we'd heard she was. Yeah. And we even got a little assist from Tom, you know, it was an yeah. off screen assist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it was, you know, but I, I, it was, a, but I loved that there was a little assist there because yeah. we've all thought he's such a bad guy all season. And it's like, no, he'll even give her his ID to yeah. get it. So, um, so I just think, it was, it's satisfying to know that you've given this great cast, you know, some, some things to play an arc to, you know, like there was an honesty to all the times we said, Nan is a badass. Do you know what I mean? We, <laughs> we, sometimes we portray Jen as a badass. Yeah. It's like, well, this is how badass she is. Like, doesn't hesitate. She's like, I'm going to take the bullet. She knows she's getting shot. She's not surprised she's getting shot. She knows. She's the only one in the scene besides Gideon who knows. I'm like, oh, I'm going to die. Yeah, she knows it in the in uh, what's now at the end of two twelve till two twelve. When she's saying Addison, come on, like she knows this. This is real. This is all. And yeah, you know. Um, but speaking of cast, we cannot leave this interview without talking about Caitlin Bassett. Yeah, I, I hope we're going there. Rib- that's exactly where I was going next, actually. Um, so I, I think one of the things that's been so incredible is is seeing the way that the characters have grown and seeing, you know, just what you were just talking about, both of you, um, about focusing on the character and, 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 and moving these characters into new places and taking them on these journeys. Um, you know, we, we, we got the chance, obviously, to talk about pretty much everyone else, but we haven't focused a lot on Addison. And I think that it's fitting that, that this is kind of where we, where we end up because uh, over the course of the two episodes that, that will air on, on, you know, on Tuesday night that people will have seen by now, um, the journey that Addison has been on the entire season and arguably the entire series seems to really just, it, 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 it's, it's almost like breaking out of a chrysalis, you know, because it, it, it's like everything that has happened before informs where she's about to go. And the scene in 212 between Hannah and Addison, which is just a brilliant scene on every level. These two people, you know, that, that, that are not in the same space, that Addison can hear Hannah. Hannah cannot hear Addison. Ad, uh, Hannah might be dying. We don't know as we're watching the scene. Um, 
it, it, yeah, it just it's just so beautiful. And then of course the scene in the car while they're racing to Jeffrey and Hannah's house, and 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 Addison looks at bed and says, "I'm sorry, I didn't wait for you," which is informed so brilliantly by the scene, you know, with the Renegade Project, if you will, uh, where you, you know where Beth has just talked about MIA, and now we realize that yeah, M- MIA is the is the is the strain of the classic series that's been playing through the whole season. Yeah. Oh, wait, let me and, just say, by the way, I, please. I, I jump in. Somewhere, winding back, I once said that fans keep talking about ways that we honor the original series, but there's <laughs> a big one that no one has noticed, and that's what it is. It was uh, <laughs> it's, the, it's, it's what Drew wrote in in, thir- in 13. It's that yeah. we, we, we've had a story before about someone who didn't wait, and I kept waiting for somebody to see that. Um, but I was very satisfied. They didn't. Sorry. Didn't yeah. mean no, that. no, it's okay. It's okay. So let's, yeah. So let's talk about the journey of Addison and, and, and furthermore also just talk about everything that Caitlin has done throughout the course of the entire series, quite frankly, because ingeniously there's this flashback to the pilot, to the premiere episode, uh, of the, of the engagement party. And it's, it's mostly focused on Addison's face. And it's just one of those things that it's like, you know this this brilliant actor has been there from day one because the story she tells on her face is you know has been is talking about quantum entanglement and everything and then of course we flash forward to to the way that she has played you know the, the way that she acts in between the lines and the way that she acts in those moments when it's not even in between the lines when she's just a party to a scene that is occurring like in 210 when they're in the caverns and and the story she tells just with her face so all of that said, yeah, now here we are. Here we are with Addison. Here we are with Caitlin. Drew, talk about what you wanted to do, you know, specifically for her character in this episode and, and kind of capitalizing on everything that's come before to sort of like finish this arc only to begin a new one. Yeah. Um, well, this is – it benefits to be in a room with showrunners who know where we're going, right? We knew – that that to end the season on Addison just dumping Tom and saying, Ben, I'm going to keep on waiting, uh, would have been enormously disappointing. And, and I think a betrayal of all the characters, because it would have been like, we know what show we're watching. This isn't fair to her or anybody else. So to have that guide guideline of where we're going and telling Caitlin, like, listen, we're going to, you know, they you're being ripped away from your main scene partner for a big chunk of the season. But it's not, you know, it's not a condemnation of any kind it's the best story <laughs> it's the best story we can tell you know um i i'm just really amazed and part of it's the material that they had there's no question about it because those scenes in two 202 203 and 204 mm-hmm. got me entirely um i've seen both of them reach these new levels of the characters this year that were that were really human and honest and real again against a, a really exciting adventurous time traveling network show they played real moments and and dean and martin were interested in those moments they were interested in emotional honesty about what this would actually do to these people and so to go through that not only that but like in nine and ten eight nine and ten really addison is in reaction she's not like she's trying to make choices she hasn't found the right one yet she's trying to make some choices of her own finally you know these are very honest things and, and kind of mistakes people can make in real life you know um, what I was really excited to do as a writer was like, if 206 was my Hannah episode and like, you know, Caitlin teased me like, great job on the script. I'm barely in it, but great job. You know, <laughs> it was like, okay, I'm going to do what I always do, which is like, when your character's up at bat, I'm going to give you the best possible material I can give you to, to perform. And so for 13, it was like, I want to show everybody watching why this team and why Ben's observer who we can take for granted sometimes because like we're here to see Ben do these leaps, how integral and crucial and, and special these people are and how he does need them. I mean, yes, he was able to get through 201 without them, but like when the rubber hits the road, these people need each other. They, they show up for each other. They'll go to the ends of the earth for each other. And there was something so great about going from a place where everyone had given up and lost hope and the project was taken away from them and shut down to – you know, a scene I wrote that wound up in 12 where she's saying, Ben is out there. I'm not going to leave him behind. I will not do that this time, you know? And so it was so exciting and so fulfilling to write Addison's last step of the journey of the season, which is I, 
I am finding my purpose. I'm finding almost a level of spiritual belief in what the hell we're doing here. You know, that, that mm. this is all happening for a reason. We cut the line out, but it still feels mm. like it's all happening for a reason. And I know what I'm supposed to do. He left without my permission to save me. <laughs> I'm going to do the same, you know, I'm going to do the same thing. And then what's beautiful about it is, um, and that scene in the car just kills me. Addison, Caitlin is just so on point this episode. She's just totally dialed in. She doesn't overplay a single moment. And that like stoic suffering when she says, I'm sorry, I didn't wait for you is so powerful. And, and the way Ben responds is so beautiful. But like, we're getting to this point where we can see her embrace her destiny and have the person she loves at the same time. Like they are given that gift after they both sort of sacrificed it, right? Like they are both feeling like we can't have this, but we'll always love each other, but we can't have this. And God, fate, time, or Hannah gives them both and, and lets us have both a happy ending and what's more important, a new beginning, right? Like they have a ways to go, even their own romance and relationship, they've got a ways to go, but they are both embracing destiny that they didn't ever expect. And that's a, an amazing journey for, for your protagonist to go on. Yeah. Yeah. And Dean, you know, this is Caitlin's basically one of her first acting jobs. And so, and I can say this for Caitlin's mom and all these things. <laughs> like, she doesn't know how good she is and she doesn't know how hard what she did is. And it's as Drew alluded to, it's a big ask in let's step out of the show for a minute. It's a big ask in the real world to take an actress who's thriving in a relationship with the, you know, the lead of the show and say, we're backgrounding you and we're bringing in a different woman. Like that is a huge ask of, of, of Caitlin as a person um, and as Addison as a character. And, and, you know, I don't think we would have asked it of a performer who we didn't know had the ability to do it. I mean, you know, one other thing I think, I think Drew will agree with me on this is season two was also written because of the cast we had. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, we're, it was, and it was why we were so determined to make sure that, you know, the guest cast was super strong, that Hannah and Tom made sense. Of, like, we have this incredible cast, which then allows you as writers to really go for it. Um, but, you know, Caitlin, I just, I just, I don't, I'll never be able to express what, how good a job I think she did. Um, and so for on a human level for Caitlin, on a, on a character level for Addison, and for what I think it says about the future of the program, I was so happy that she says, like, I'm going to be the leap. Like, I'm going. Mm -hmm. Like, I was just like, it, it, so it, it, it hits me on three levels when I see that moment. You know, like, it hits me the behind the scenes way because <laughs> you know, I, Caitlin gets to finally be in a leap. Um, you know, after two seasons of it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, I, I think it's just we, we, we waited a long time in this particular podcast to talk about Addison and Caitlin, but not because they're not integral to the show, but in a lot of ways, because I think she's kind of the linchpin to the sh whole show. Her and Ray are the linchpin yeah. to the show. And if, and if either of them don't work, then you know, you just are telling a different story. Well, I think that one of the things that's kind of remarkable, right, is it's obvious that Ben and Ray are, are, are I mean, that's, that's our star of a show, right? Like, that's, that's yeah. our leaper. But the thing that, that, that I think is even more remarkable, and, and Drew, you said something that really clicked with me, is I would argue that Addison in season one wasn't ready to be the leaper. Mm -hmm. She might have trained for it, Agreed. but I don't yeah. think she was ready to be the leaper. Addison, in that three-year gap, when she tried to jump into the accelerator, you know, out of grief wasn't yep. ready to be the leaper but the spiritual and emotional maturation of the character over the course of yep. this season she's ready to be the leaper yeah. yeah you know she's ready to save people not just go you know complete her mission right to be the soldier yeah. which by the way how badass is caitlin disarming that guard yeah. and then you know <laughs> i've been waiting <laughs> so long for that moment on this show yeah <laughs> well, but, like, what you're saying sam is not i mean that's absolutely the intention like yeah. that was when we realized we wanted to end season two with 
Caitlin with Addison stepping into the image chamber, it did become for us about this is we're we're building the ultimate voyager. We're building yeah. the ultimate traveler through uh, her in her spiritually. Um, <clears throat> so uh, glad that that comes across because that's. I had forgotten that she put herself in, in the imaging chamber and it didn't work. I forgot that we did. Accelerator, yeah. The accelerator, yeah. The, you know, it was, I think you asked us when we came on and did 206, which is like the first time we could talk about any episode because the, yeah. the strike finally ended. You're like, what was it like being able to watch those episodes? And what was really awesome, I think, was watching all completed eight. You know, we knew that the audience ha was going to invest in Ben and Hannah in a big way. You know, we knew that that we knew that that in six and an eight and in three, those episodes did exactly what they needed to do. Mm -hmm. And if anything, nine through 13 had an even tougher job, which is, like, OK, how are we going to get to where we need to go now? Like, how are we really? And I think what was really amazing about the process of, of nine to 13 was Dean and Martin both knew if something wasn't tracking properly for the building of those character arcs, we needed to go back and fix it. And we did. There were there were critical moments in those last five where scripts were being written and we stopped and said, okay, wait a minute, this is not setting us up for these characters to get to where they need to be in a way that's believable and authentic and honest. And and they stopped and made those moments work. And I think like I love everything in two eleven between Ben and Addison is wonderful. But it's all really setting the table for this final these final steps she's taking and that they're going to take together, you know? Um, so I just think like, again, there was a vision for this season from the beginning and we made discoveries along the way and we made, you know, we all put our heart and souls into it, but that, that telling a story you believe in, even though it's risky, which it was on a lot of levels, we did a four episode breakup story, you know, that's, that's risky, but it real like all those steps, in a serialized format, give you the, the, the strongest payoff, which is what we wanted to deliver, and I think we did. Um, and these characters are ready, are now ready. I think it's like it's funny you say it, Sam. I, I thought two thirteen is like the end of a two season long origin story. You know, like totally. for both yeah. of them in a lot of ways. You know, because what Gideon's saying again is true. Like you're, this was just a way to get Addison back and go home. You're not, you didn't choose this at all. You're not trying to save the world. And by the end of this, I'm not saying Ben is fully, you know. But there's something about what he's proven to himself and to Addison and, and to Jeffrey and everybody and Hannah about who he is and what he's doing, whether it was the plan or not, that is really apparent and powerful by the end of the season. It is. And it's, in, in, it's apparent and powerful in the very end of this episode, because when Addison leaps and looks like she stepped right off the stages of Casablanca and it looks awesome and the whole scene looks awesome and sees Ben and, and it's beautiful and it's moving and, 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 and it had me reaching for the tissue box. Uh, you, you know, I, I watched it again this morning and was still crying. Uh, I didn't know if I was even going to be able to like get on this <laughs> podcast and not be choked up, quite frankly. The thing is, and, 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 and this choice is, is just the icing on the cake in my opinion because there's the explosion and they grab hands and they run towards the explosion and that's that's it right the origin story like you said is completed like these are our superheroes they they, they run towards the fire and it's yeah. fucking awesome um i just have a couple more quick questions before we get out of here i one thing that i did want to ask uh was there ever ever an inkling of an idea plan that hannah would would actually die in 212 because it is definitely teased and it had me you know i wondered if it was going to happen i speculated on it on the last podcast with jj i was like i don't know i don't know if she makes it out of here was that ever a possibility i don't think we ever talked about it i think yeah i think if anything it was we talked about her age like in yeah, the mm -hmm. present that she would not be here because she'd be at least right. 100 so that didn't seem yeah so i think and even the way it's interesting Gideon talks about her as if she's deceased. He says, my, it's, this was my mother's life's work. Yeah. It feels like she's you know, passed away of old age, but never in the leaps themselves, I don't think. And okay. then, to be clear, it's not that we had a very strong, we weren't like, well, whatever we do, we can't kill her. Sure. You know what I mean? Like we were yeah. following her story where it went. And I think what Ben and Derek did so well in 212 was, you know, it's hard to figure out how are we going to start to close the story between Ben and Hannah, at least for yeah. season, two. you know, who knows, right? But right. and um, you know, hence the choice in two hundred nine to 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 pull the rug out from under the audience that's you know had the romantic two hundred eight, 
right? The before sunrise 208. And then we pull the rug out from our characters and our audience in 209. Um, you know, and I'm sure they were probably like, well, you, you've tried to poison me against Ben and Addison. And now you're trying to poison me against Ben and Hannah. Like, <laughs> we, we hate you, right? Um, but, um, and then 10, 11 be the beginning of the reconnection between Ben and Addison. Not, and it yeah. doesn't necessarily need to be falling back in love, right? It, right. At the first, was, well, that wasn't our goal. It was really just to see, like, putting all the crap aside. Let's remember how much they care about each other. And, yeah. then, and then by putting Hannah in a life and death circumstances, it was a brilliant way to sort of also, I, it makes the reveal of the code go down easier. For me, sure, you know sure. I mean? like because, like, I think if it was like a quiet, calm episode, and it was like, oh my god, you you wrote the code, <laughs> like it's, it's it's just more powerful that she's sort of forced, she's actually forced to reveal it. Right? Absolutely. Like, um, so we never said we were going to kill her or not kill her, um, but we originally didn't plan to bring her back in two thirteen. It was mm -hmm. Drew who came up with the idea of, I mean, argued I think quite successfully. I think we're going to want to see her one more time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I completely agree. And I will just say bravo because the the fact of the matter is is I did one I like I was I was sincerely worried about her well-being throughout the course of the yeah. episode. And and yeah. that's not an easy thing to do quite frankly, you know, because we 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 hear terms like plot armor and characters being bulletproof thrown around willy-nilly all over the internet these days and it's like and and the truth of the matter is is I did. I thought I was I was genuinely concerned as to whether or not she was going to make it out of the episode. It, it, was, um, it would have been a good it would have been a good dramatic choice because then ben, then we would have Ben blaming himself right um, you know and one quick other thing i'll say just the behind the scene things you know because of the strike we did not know how long season two would be and this is i i'm just speaking to because i've seen this online a little bit we legitimately sure. didn't know yeah. so we we had to design a season that we could accomplish in 13 episodes but that if we if they needed more we were going to tell the same story just a little bit slower in a few places um and then the nature of the strike was just that there's now such a backlog of episodes of other shows that they said, you know, we got to do 13. But I think I'm going that to say, like, I think the room and the individual writers just did a great job landing the plane from nine to 13 because it was there was a lot of ground to cover. And if they did it too fast or too slow, I think it would have lost a lot of its power. Yeah. And yeah. they all nailed it. They just all nailed it. Now, something else about this episode that I think obviously is, uh, you know, been integral to the fabric of the season and, and the show really as a whole uh, is is the direction of this episode is handled by Chris Grismer. And Chris has been, um, I, I just think, such a, an important piece of the creative team um, overall. Um, yeah. and, and having him direct this final episode of the season and kind of help to bring all of that home Um uh, I'll start with you, Dean. Can you just talk about Chris's contributions to the show and then specifically a little bit about his direction of this episode? I sure can as soon as this siren goes by. Um, that's, that was, that's basically Chris's job right there. He's like always running to save us somewhere. No, you know, for, for people who don't know, so a producing director is basically a director who stays on for the run of the entire series to sort of make sure that the direction of all the episodes feels consistent. So they have this impossible job in a way of aiding other filmmakers without stepping on their vision. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, every few times a season, they get to, to, to direct. And, you know, Chris, um, besides just being a wonderful guy and a great leader on set. And I mean, he's really the leader on set. He sets the tone, um, but he's just a fantastic filmmaker. Just, I mean, you know, Drew wrote a movie in 213. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Chris figured out how to film it in eight days. <laughs> yeah. And he and Anna, or one of our directors of photography, um, you know, things like the racetrack, of, like those moments are exciting and feel cinematic to me, but then the emotional moments are nailed. And I just, I mean, I just think, you know, he's just one of these, one of these angels in this show. Is yeah. you know like I mean, I can't tell you what it feels like to read Drew's script and know 
that the episode is going to turn out yeah. at least as good as the script. And um, I'm, I'm continually amazed by what Chris does, to be honest with you. Yeah, Chris, I, I, to shout out the three of them, Chris Grismer, our producing director and executive producer, Anna Mortagani, our amazing cinematographer, and Ian Mayberry, our editor for the episode. Mm. Also, shout out Ryan Trailer, our, our AD. Yeah. These folks all came together. They're, they're not just professionals, they're artists. They're professional artists, you know, and they, you know, Anna, every episode she shoots, she wants to push it as filmic and as cinematic and as beautiful as possible. Chris yeah, Grisner comes brilliant. in with an impossible day to shoot and human trailer, figure out how to maximize the time we have to get it all. And does not, I, I thought we were going to cut a lot of things out of the script to make it shootable. We did not sacrifice anything that we wanted to shoot. Like they, they, once they read it, they knew they wanted to get it and we got it and we got it in beautiful fashion. The performances are great. The casting was great. And then Ian's editing is just so elegant, so incredible. The choices of music all throughout it just, everybody was working from a place of passion, excitement, and and real belief that we are making something special every week and del- and need to deliver something special at the very end. And you you don't find crews and casts like this on every show that are really collaborative, pleasant to work with, amazing human beings, and do great work. That's really hard to find, and we're very blessed to have all of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I've said this a number of times, and I'll continue to say it, but it just does. It seems like an incredibly special environment and and, and a great group to be able to collaborate with and, and, and make this uh, incredibly special show. Um, it, you know, one last thing about that, Drew, you had mentioned, and, and I want to thank you for this, that, uh, you know, that you and Shakina had been on set during the, the filming that Shakina had been shadowing Chris a bit. So I got to ask her a little bit about that, which was great. Um, you know, was there anything, any particular moments that stood out to you while you were on set? And, you know, as, as far as like a Chris story or something like that, is there a specific moment that you're just like, ah, <laughs> About Chris or just about the the, the, the shoot? In, about in Chris, but but I mean the shoot in well, general, I suppose. Yes, yes. I, I almost feel like it's his story to tell. There was, <laughs> I'll say two things. One, having Shakita on set was amazing because she was there to shout out Grismer, but she became my set buddy. And so all the <laughs> amazing moments we were getting on set, we were like, holy shit, we're getting this. Mm-hmm. The most fun part of that is to turn the person you're with and be like, can you believe we're getting this shit? This is amazing. <laughs> Shakita had that all the way through. It was wonderful. But I will say this, Grismer had very strong ideas about how we were going to advance the visual language from the Ben and Hannah romance to the Addison and Ben connection. Mm. And there were certain choices made in how those scenes were filmed on a technical level that were all about how to make sure that we were guiding the audience emotionally to where we wanted them to go on, on, on just like the actual technology we were using to make those scenes cast the right spell and there's choices he made and even unmade at certain points to make sure we protected those moments and made them play the exact right tone. And I think the performances and the visuals of this episode are just so dialed in and, and totally on point. And Chris was, you know, he, you know, he, it wasn't like we talked a lot beforehand because, like, I was like, you know, ready to talk about anything. But Chris just went in and like on set we would we would we would dialogue about stuff. But he really he put thought into the stuff ahead of time that he really needed to. And he made some of these moments look and feel like a movie, like Quantum Leap, the movie. That's what we set up yeah. to make. We pulled it off because of this team and this director. And just to sort of, just to put it up on a board for a second, Chris directed basically our Exorcist episode. <laughs> he directed our Battleship Hunt for Red October, you know, Red episode. He directed our season one finale. He directed an Alien, it's our real episode he directed a, an episode that actually filmed in egypt and he directed this so just in terms of looking at the episodes you know uh, starting with the year of little faith like the that tells you what yeah. kind of artist we're getting to work with yeah yeah always absolutely. by the way always on time always on budget words that mean a lot in our business <laughs> oh that's fantastic yeah he's he's done fantastic work for the show and 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 i can you know i can only hope to see see more and and i hope to talk to him very soon so um yeah just just remarkable work on this episode that can be arranged so and i'm prepared to cut this out if necessary obviously but uh but it, you know I, I i can't help but ask and i know people will be curious but what are your thoughts on a season three well, I mean, you know, from strictly story point, 
I, I, what I'm excited about is the possibility of what's a two leaper <laughs> leap look like, you know, what happens if their father and daughter in one episode <laughs> and Addison and the father, what if they're like criminal partners? It, what if they're cop and bad guys? So I think one of the things that we've done in success is we've created a way to expand Deborah's universe yet again. Yeah. Um, in a, in a character forward way. Um, at the same time, and it, it, we, we have closed the introductory chapter of, I think what in our minds would be a much longer story. Yeah. You know sure. what I mean? Like, it, it, and, and it's why, and I think Drew wrote it so beautifully. It's why it's not like it's giant kisses and we're all perfectly united at the end of this episode, right? It's not, right. they're not at a wedding chapel. They haven't leapt into two people about to get married. Right. You know, they've reconnected, which is all they've really wanted. And are there feelings there? Sure. Like, is there a romance there? Sure. Of course. Like we, we play it, but yeah. it's not like their story is necessarily settled either. I love what you said earlier, both of you, that in a way we have two human beings who are, you know, equipped uniquely to move forward, um, yeah. including one of them who wanted to do it. Um, <laughs> and so to me, I just think the possibilities are endless. I think the process will be, we'll sit down uh, if and when we get the good news and we'll do what we did this season, which is we'll think, okay, well, we did a romance novel and explored the costs of that in season two. What do we want to explore in season three? And we'll build it out from there. I don't know. Does that make sense to Drew? What do you think? Yeah. He's I, got the whole season in his head already. So <laughs> he's hinted at that a little bit. <laughs> he's already, he already has. He's already pitched. He's already come up with like three great episodes. I, yeah. <laughs> but so have Alex and Dean and I all just chatted about some stuff that was really exciting. Um, uh, at the end of the season, I'll, I'll say that I think what I really appreciate about season two of Quantum Leap is we upped our ambitions for what the show can be. And I think the success of th some of those choices and those risks that were taken uh, is so invigorating and has inspired so much confidence as, in ourselves as storytellers that I think that I, Ray was saying, we were out on set one day and Ray was just like, I feel we've scratched the surface of what we can do. Like that we can, yeah. we can keep going. Like, we can keep raising the bar. And I, I do think like there are stories we can tell, especially with Ben Addison uh, now and with the team and, and, and that are, that can continue to, to innovate and fulfill the, the limitless potential of what quantum leap can be. And, um, and sometimes that does, that means going further into some cool sci-fi stuff. And sometimes like in the case of the outsider, it's just like telling really mm. great character based stories that stick with you and make you really care about somebody, you know, that, that you'll never see again. And, and I think we can do all of it. Like we can do all of it in a way. And if, if season two is any indication, we can really take viewers in a, on, a, on a ride that feels utterly epic and intimate in, in its, in its scope and ambition. So I think if we get a season three, you, you haven't seen nothing yet. I think one of the, <laughs> just the joke that was so beautifully said true. um, just to add to it, it's, you know, one of the things I think subconsciously we wanted to do was unlock our ability to be funny. You know, the, the setup of both season one and season two, like you, we've injected humor where we can. Yeah. But, you know, the original show, Dean Stockwell and the kind of humor that the writers and he were able to bring, and obviously Scott, by his performance and, and the situations, there was a humor and a lightness to it. You know, I, I know personally, I wouldn't mind, I'm not saying it turns into silly comedy, but I am looking forward to having Addison and Ben, at, like, be able to disagree about the course of a leap. Yep. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> like, I know how this goes. Like, again, I'm not, not that we'll turn them into the Vickersons. It's just, if you think about it, we don't, we've now removed the heavy hanging over it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we, we, we kind of will get to pick where we go. 
And we get to well, play more, more rock, paper, scissors because we're going to need a new hologram. Too, I so. was just getting ready to say somebody else is going to have to step into that imaging chamber. <laughs> so I, I know that I know that there's a certain someone that a lot of the uh, fans would love to see do that um, on, a, on a more regular basis, perhaps. Uh, well, I, 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 I you know, I, I there are obviously always more questions, um, but I, I appreciate you both for, for sharing the time um so much and uh before before we get out of here i will of course uh wrap up with a question i've been asking everybody lately um drew of course you mentioned matt earlier and um it's 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 hard to imagine uh a world without him in it to talk about this episode and this season and these episodes um matt has indeed served as a beautiful example um, for, for all of us and been such an incredibly important part of this community and someone who's been incredibly important to me. Yeah. And one of the ways that I can continue to honor him, um, and, 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 and pay tribute to his legacy and, and what he has meant to me, um, is to ask people. And in this case, I think because of this episode, because of this season, because of your connection to Matt as well, I can go one step further and I can say, what did Matt mean to you? And then of course my, my, my regular question is what inspires you? Uh, do I have to go first? Is that, no, that's yeah, Drew, me. you got to go I'll first. Dean go. Let Dean, go. Dean, Dean, okay. Dean can go first. Well, you know, I did an interview with Matt and the team. Probably I was probably one of the, it, last interviews, it was it was not much. It was only a short amount of time later that I got the news. And, you know, it's interesting. In the modern world, there's a relationship between writers and audience that didn't necessarily always exist. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's bad so yeah. in, in terms of it's hard to read this stuff. Um, but what, what he did was he made it human. And you've mm -hmm. done that as well. But he made it human and he, you know, his enthusiasm for not just the show, our show, but his enthusiasm for these ideas and for where these ideas can go, um, including like when, you know, when he thought we, we, you zigged when we should have zagged or when he thought he <laughs> could have pushed further. Like it was just, you know, it was. I'm just going to miss him, you know, like I just, I just, he did become a part of the family yeah. Um, in a way that wouldn't have happened 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. And, you know, I, the best thing I can say is like, anytime I saw a text or email or whatever, and it was him, I just smiled and, and, and I'm, I'm holding on to that. You know, I, 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 I like to think that, that some part of him got to see the completed season. Um, and, and I, I, but I firmly believe, and I hope everyone in his life knows he's a part of the DNA of our show forever. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I that's a beautifully put, I, I would agree. I feel like Matt is in 213 in ways, both intentional and, and, um, and unintentional and, um, you know, it, it's it's weird to grieve people we don't get to spend time with in real life, and it's confusing. And you don't, you're asking me, what do you mean to me? I was asking myself that question for the last three months. You know, like what? This is so crazy that this is. I'm feeling all these these terrible feelings of grief for someone that we, you know, communicated with electronically. What's what's great about Matt that that Dee just touched on is criticisms or praise regardless of what it was, it came from a place of love for this stuff, you know, and what inspires me is to create from that same place. And it's, I think it's why Dean and I work so well together. We both, we come from a place of, we love the characters we write and we want to see them do great things. We love the audience because we imagine ourselves as them. We're not writing like it's McDonald's and you're ordering fan service drive through I'm writing for the fan in myself and believing that somebody out there is going to have the same experience and is going to be, you know, is going to cherish the emotional journey of great storytelling and what it can mean. And Matt did that. And so 
I, I wanted him to see this more than anything. I wanted to talk with him about it more than anything. And, and it breaks my heart that we didn't get to share this with him because it really was for the Matt Dales of, of, of the fandom. Yeah. But, um, but he, he contributed in ways he'll never understand or, or know, or no one will really, and, and just as everybody in this community has. And so we need more people like Matt who are, who are coming from a place of love and not just, you know, hate clicks and, and the like. And, um, and I, I'm glad that we got to know him for as long as we did because it was, he was a, such a special person and um and i making him happy was a great delight for all of us <laughs> and you know i should i want to give credit to people who aren't on this podcast the whole group i should say the writers the producers everyone is not <clears throat> people had started to ask us if we would dedicate an episode to matt it was already in the works yeah martin and deborah were spearheading it and you know not to pat ourselves on the back but it's not that easy to do and 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 but what they all collectively believed was in a show that's had one title card and an episode in the past <laughs> that I, like as much as it was horrible to have to dedicate something to him because we can't believe that he's gone it, it just it resonated with me i just i just found myself thinking like this uh, this is a goodbye to another beloved person we did, had one fictional in the first run and now, you know, this one's not fictional it, mm -hmm. and it just, there was something about that and about the season we were telling that just makes me believe that there's more to all of this. And so I don't, I don't feel like Matt's gone from us. Do you know what I mean? Like, and that's, yeah. I don't know that I would have said that at the start of the year either. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Dean, what inspires you? I think curiosity. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I life and how we are supposed to navigate it with these conflicting drives and knowing, you know, we're 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 a being that knows its time is finite. On at least in this version. You know, we get to learn a lot of things, but we're not getting any info on what happens. Um, and so I think what inspires me is to just continually ask the questions of how are we supposed to navigate this? Like, how do we reassure one another? How do we come together when times are bad? How do we not give up hope? You know, it's I, like I'm, I'm just endlessly curious um, and I'm I've always been amazed with the following thing that we as a species have the ability to tell ourselves a story to explain an actual event. And what I mean by that is, you know, we did like Life of Pi being an example, like you, we, we can use our imaginations to feel connected to Matt. We can use our imaginations to make sense out of things that don't make sense. And I think, so that's the other thing that inspires me. We have this gift. We've literally been given an imagination that can help us make sense of a world that can be very challenging at times. I love that. Drew, what inspires you? Uh, just what I was saying earlier, I, I think just, um, uh, you know, cre I, I, I think creating anything is, is a spiritual experience for me. And so, uh, so to create from a place that is, um, larger than us to tap into something bigger than us in a way to, to, to bring something to people, whether it's, whether it's entertainment or a sense of understanding the world around us in some way, I, I think it comes from a place of, of love. I really do. I think it's, it's, there's different kinds, spiritual, romantic, uh, platonic, familial. It, it's all, a, it's a kind of energy that we're all tapping into when we do things that are really important. And so I, I look for that in the work that I really love to watch in the stuff that people write, direct, perform. And I, I'm always looking for it for what I can create as well. It needs to come from that same, that same, uh, source. So I, I think that's what inspires me is, uh, a, a sort of spiritual kind of love that goes into creation itself. Thank you both so much. This has been uh, incredible. We've gone way over time, of course. Of and, course. Uh, <laughs> For real. On brand. I, 
I I uh I, I just can't thank you enough um for for all of your work. Um, you know, Drew, you touched on this earlier. Uh I mentioned this to you already. I, I watched these episodes and I watched the finale specifically and after it was over I just I, I I just felt metaphorically speaking, of course, this was something that was written for me. And it was just incredible to 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 you know walk away feeling that. Um and, and just feeling so satisfied and, and 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 not just satisfied, but challenged and 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 moved and engaged um um on every level. Um and to just to just look at those faces running towards the fire in those final moments and hear that music and just be incredibly uh, uh, um, motivated for for the future uh, of, of Quantum Leap. So uh, I thank you both. I thank everyone involved, quite frankly. And I'm so excited just, to get to talk to, to. I was just about to say, that, sorry to interrupt. No. For conclusion, but I think we would be remiss to not thank the incredible crew from casting to post-production this this really has been a team all rowing in the same direction yeah like every department has pulled off miracles frankly you know the art department cinematographers cut mm -hmm. like you know we're asking them to we're basically asking them to do the impossible <laughs> and at a certain point you only keep doing the impossible because you care. Yeah. You care about each other. So the, the cast and crew, I think we were all like a family. We are a family. But you also care because you believe and you're trying to make a difference in your own way. So, you know, it always frustrates me how on TV the credits at the end just go <laughs> just because it's like, let me tell you, and, and Drew and I could do this. We could go through every one of these first 30 whatever episodes it is and tell you three people yeah. on the crew, three different people every episode who saved the episode or who made the episode better. So I, I, I wish I'd said it earlier, but it, 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 because we're talking about the season two finale, the season two, every single member of the season two crew is the reason that episode is good. And that's not yeah. an exaggeration. It's true. Well, maybe during this hiatus, you can help connect me with some of those people and we can get them on this show and talk to them and, and talk about their experiences because I love collaboration and I love the collaborative effort of, of you know, of, of, of television, film, theater, etc. And I just think that it is absolutely true. Um, you know, an audience only sees such a small part, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole, they see the whole, the finished whole, but they, but they, you know, don't see all of the pieces that help to make that work, all the people that come together to make that work, that believe in something, like you said, and so passionate about it and i am i am genuinely just on, on, an, on, an, on a very personal deep level grateful to everyone that has worked on this show and and made it what it is because um it has been just such a, an incredibly special journey for me as a as, as a fan and as someone who just enjoys it so much and feels like it's special and it's necessary and it is unlike anything else on television and 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 i want to see more and more and more and more stories so um yeah, start start. Your lips to God's ears, but uh, <laughs> also thank you, Sam, for all all of your passionate coverage of the show and and just everything you do as part of the community has been amazing, and and we are grateful. And regardless of how you feel episode episode, we're just we are grateful that people like you are uh, sharing their passion in such a really constructive and amazing way. So always an honor to talk to you, and we hope to do it again. That sounds wonderful. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. Thank you all for listening and watching. Take care of yourselves. Take care of one another. Stay safe out there. And remember to always sleep responsibly.